there are too many people that are living rough or trying to survive in the recesses of buildings or alleyways. And now along with a team of community members and professionals, Julia Colick founded HATS, the Hamilton Alliance for Tiny Shelters to provide temporary safe warm cabins as a solution for this desperate emergency. So I'm gonna turn things over today to Julia for this presentation. Julia, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you and thanks for inviting me. Um, I want to start by telling you, first of all, how I got involved with this and also give you some um, background data um, about what is actually happening in our country, in our city. And to preface this by saying I'm not a statistician and I'm not someone who actually works in the front line with people experiencing homelessness. However, I've, I've learned a huge amount and I'm happy to tell you um, really what has been going on and some of the things that we've been trying. So as a way of introduce, introducing how this program, Hamilton Alliance for Tiny Shelters began, um, I realized there was someone sitting on a cushion and with a little more than a blanket last oh, two winters ago now, living underneath a bridge around the corner from where I live. And I just thought, you know, we've got to do something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by telling you the bad news, if you like, about the reality of all this. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the um, great people that have come together to try and find a solution. I do have a um, presentation here, which I will start with. So hope you can all see this, okay? Okay, I'll just, uh, can everybody see this okay? Just give me a thumbs up. Right. I, I think it would be really hard to walk up, to be in our city and not realize that people are living like this. And um, one of the things I realized was the visible homelessness is actually, I think this really explains what is actually happening. People who you see on the street are the visible homeless, but the, it's like an iceberg. This is from the Wellesley Institute. It's an old image, but I think even if the numbers don't aren't up to date, they certainly represent what is really happening because there's people living in all kinds of states of insecure uh, home situations. What's happening in Hamilton is quite shocking because being living on the street, as you can imagine, living through the snowstorm the other day is actually very bad for, for your health. It doesn't It goes without saying. Um, so I'll, I'll walk you through some of the uh, issues that are happening. I think the biggest one is thinking that there's enough shelter beds for people, and there actually isn't. There's lots of reasons why people do not go into a shelter. It's not safe. Um, it, it, it can be uh, difficult to get in if you're a couple, because the shelters are divided between men, women, and if you're uh, of a different gender, um, then that's even more problematic. If you have a pet, you're not allowed to come in with your pet. And you actually, if you, if you decide to go into the shelter, you have to give up your pet. And very often, as we all know, if we've all had a pet, it could be like a member of the family. And especially for people in really difficult situations, it's a huge comfort to have, uh, a, have an animal with you. So this gives you, this is actually from the city of Hamilton's website. They have trouble keeping their numbers up to date, but I just thought it would give you an idea of the reasons why people become homeless. And I've actually sat and talked with people who have found themselves in that situation. And it really, it comes down to very um, narrow numbers of stories, surprisingly. It can be women fleeing an abusive relationship. It can be young people who have uh, suffered abuse at home and flee their home. It can be people who have had a lovely home, a career, you know, the, the, the two cars, the family, the holidays, 
and they there's something happens with their job, they lose it, they lose their business, the family breaks up, and suddenly they lose everything. And it's just a few of the stories that uh, that seem to come up again and again. And very often, as you can see at the top five barriers, it's really a case of poverty and mental health challenges. I can't imagine that anyone would choose to live in a tent outside and, and have strong mental health. I mean, it's bound to affect you, right? So there's a, a few doctors here in our city who are really dedicated to working uh, with uh, the urban population. And they did a study, and now this is out of date, almost a year, as you can tell me. And they, they reported 29 deaths. And as you can see, the average age is awfully young. If you think our community is immune from this issue, of course it's not. So again, these are numbers that I got some time ago from Hamilton Jewish Family Services. And the precarious housing, which is maybe struggling to find next month's rent or trying to find somewhere to stay, staying with a friend, sleeping on a sofa, whatever that might be, there's at least 35 people in and around our city who are Jewish, who are having, who are struggling. And I'm sure that number has gone up recently. This, this is a Stats Canada, and I'm sure it's out of date. As you probably know, our food bank feeds 50 families. So that's not 50 people, that's 50 families. Um, so you can see we're, we're, in a, we're in a dire situation here. However, coming back to people who are sleeping on the street, there is some good news. So I, I want to show you a, a video of, this was um, actually what inspired me. It, it's actually a program that's happening in um, another community in Kitchener, Waterloo. Uh, and I'm going to hope that it's a, it's, a, it's a short video. I'm hoping that you'd be able to watch it okay. Let's see if this works. Can you see that screen? Someone tell me that they can see it. Can they see this? Yes. Good, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to just keep quiet now and I'll, I'll let you watch this video that explains uh, the inspiration for what we're trying to do here in Hamilton. In Kitchener, Waterloo, the issue of homelessness is a polarizing one. I mean, this is Canada. Everybody's got an opportunity to get an education and a job. I'd say pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The city's response is not great. You know, there's a lot of people that are on the streets. They can't even sleep at a park. They can't sleep anywhere without getting harassed by police. They're easily silenced and they can't advocate on their own behalf most of the time. I had a business downtown, Duke Corner Store. I kept seeing homeless people outside sleeping and I'm like, what's going on in this town? If you paid attention, you could feel the friction slowly turning to fire. And I said, screw this, something has to be done. I actually turned my store into a homeless shelter as a protest. With an upscale restaurant set to open up across the street, Nadine's convenience store full of tents rubbed a lot of influential people the wrong way. And if the issue of homelessness was a fire, Ron Doyle represented gasoline. When I first met Ron Doyle, I wondered who he was because he just walked into the store like he owned it. Here's a guy who's rough around the edges. He swears a lot. He's pushy. He can be a little obstinate sometimes, uh, even belligerent. Meanwhile, the city had shut my store down. They had COVID hit. So I attended an emergency meeting about the homeless crisis. Ron interrupts the meeting and says, Nadine, what if starting tonight you come and live on my property? and you bring anyone you want to. And then the same night I went out and I got 15 homeless people and I picked them up around in here and I went back for another trip. Soon, Nadine's indoor tent city was reborn under Ron's roof. There is a group of people that think that this is very wrong. And they think that if we give people a little bit of rope, they're gonna hang themselves here. 
But I think if you give people a chance and give them back their dignity, they can change. Jeff, it's Ron Doyle. Listen, I want you to come check out what we've got going on here. I may not have been the most sympathetic city employee. That's something I really regret doing. I hear you, man. So you'd rather be homeless than be separated from your dog? Mm -hmm. But actually taking the time to learn about these people's stories, my presumptions about them are simply not true. working in my wood shop and I hear a honking. So I'm driving down the highway when I saw this homemade shed for sale. And I asked him, how much do you need to make a bunch of these? But then he told me what he needed these structures for. Eventually I decided to join the project to help work around the bylaws threatening to shut it down. So this provincial order this is our ticket to get around the zoning issue. Being here, I've seen how these tiny homes make a huge impact on the lives of these people. Welcome to my house. So I got a spot to put my artwork up. Not too big, but perfect. No building permits, no problem. No issues at all. It's so nice to have in here. Shelf for all my stuff. Just have power hooked up, so up right or down. Yeah, that looks way better than that. Volunteering here, I noticed Ron, who got where he is by marching to his own feet, and at the camp residents, who also crave control of their own lives. They are the most unlikely, yet most perfect allies. And they aren't marching alone. I get involved with projects like this because these are our brothers and sisters at the end of the day. A better 10 city has given my life so much meaning and purpose. This is a team we're honored to be part of. Ron can be impatient. I can't stand people who talk your ear off, but don't lift a finger when it's time to get going. But if one of my parishioners finds a new way to help the less fortunate, then I'm gonna get behind that. I see the world very differently now. Everybody has a unique story, and I have the people here to thank for giving mine a better ending. There are currently over 50 residents living at a better tent city with more structures arriving to meet the increasing demand. It's getting there, one piece at a time. Through creating this thriving community, this most unexpected crew found strength and solidarity. Don't forget we are a better tent city and they're all illegal. And so are we, <laughs> so let's go. And learned they were stronger still when they worked together. Maybe it's time then we all ask ourselves, who can I lend my strength to? So um, I, I'm not sure if, uh, if you're back onto the um, onto the slide deck. So that I, I watched that film um, many times, and it still uh, found it very moving, um, and it really was the inspiration for um, what we are starting here. We come from a, a housing first place, and just like in that film, we think that the first thing you can do is give someone somewhere to live and then help them along the way to solve whatever issues are challenging them in their lives. It is really a healing process. So we're, a, we're in, an incorporated nonprofit. We actually have a charitable uh, partner. So, uh, with the R um, SPRC, that's Social Planning and Research Council of Hamilton. We can, uh, we can um, get advice from them, but they also uh, can, means that we can issue charitable uh, receipts. We are funded solely at the moment by donations and grants. I'll talk a bit about that later, but our aim really is to ease the crisis that we're facing here. 
we have a fabulous leadership team, people from all different uh, areas of the city, including uh, our indigenous friends and um, Wesley Urban Ministries is a big partner. So is a Poverty Roundtable. And um, we have people with professional uh, expertise. We have a legal team and a professional planner who uh, lends his time, which is, uh, as you'll find out, very important aspect as well. We meet once a week and uh, have been working really hard now uh, for probably uh, over a year. We've built lots of bridges with our partners in the community, as you can see here. And we are part of a growing movement. This is happening across Canada and North America. We're providing small, tiny homes uh, with supported services is, uh, is one quick and fast solution to the immediacy of getting people off the streets. This is how we fit into the housing continuum. We take people off the streets, we give them a, a home of their own, a key uh, privacy and uh, support, and it helps them on their journey as they become hopefully permanently housed in supportive housing. So just to give you an idea of what these uh, particular homes are like. It's got practically everything inside except uh, plumbing. And the reason for that is the minute you start doing that, you're getting into uh, building permits. So the idea is you have a communal kitchen and a communal washroom and showers. Inside though, there's a bed, uh, a small fridge and a microwave to, to store food. Um, and as I said, they're the only ones who have the key to their, their particular home. Some other components for you. This is a, a, an idea of how plan would look like once we get a piece of land. Uh, and we would phase in the homes because we're in, it's a new, it's a proven project, but it, it's new. So we need to phase it in um, slowly. We would have uh, site managers and security. So it's a 24 seven managed operation, which is uh, what other communities are doing as well. And we've been very fortunate. We have more than 90 volunteers who have, are forming working groups around different aspects of the program. For example, site maintenance or uh, food preparation, for example. Or we've got people who uh, are chefs uh, who have are very interested in helping us develop a food program, whether that's with life skills or just providing food for people when they first move in and need that support. In terms of support, we have, um, we're working with all the other organizations across the city who really uh, right now are struggling. And the reason is because more and more um, people who are on the street, and there's probably, the city says there's 50 people right now, but we know that not everyone is registered. So it could be more than 50 people. And they're being um, pushed to the margins, you know, moved along and told to spread out. Some are living in the escarpment. You might've seen them on your walks on the rail trail. It makes it very hard for support services to find them and to help them get to their appointments, or uh, you know, just make sure that they're doing okay. Whereas if you have um, a, a site where there's a small community, a village, if you like, it's much easier to make appointments, to see people um, and uh, health checks and, and all those kinds of things if, if people know where they are, right? Very important that we're a client-driven program. So we have, conducted a, a survey and invited their opinions. We, uh, who did we ask? We, we surveyed 36 people at two particular locations that serve the homeless. Uh, actually, the Wesley Day Center is going to be closing at the end of this month. The hub, both of these um, centers are currently downtown. Of the people we interviewed, almost all said they would like a tiny home. And when you do a survey, if anyone has ever done one, getting a percentage like that on, on agreement on any topic 
is pretty high. Why did people want a tiny home? So here you can see all the different reasons that people gave. The biggest one being, of course, that it's better than being on the street and they wanted their own home. Safety is huge because you'll see um, people will walk around with backpacks because the minute they, put, they leave anything anywhere, it's likely to get stolen. And that's been a big issue. I talked to one woman who she and her partner actually did manage to move into an apartment. And even though she was in her own space, she was still wearing her backpack when she went to the bathroom. And she said it's such a, a strong habit that's really hard to break. So how do we choose people to come into the program? And of course, we would want to help everybody. But at the, uh, when we start up, we won't be able to. So we have an intake committee made up of people who work with um, frontline organizations who work with those who are experiencing homelessness, including we have uh, someone on our committee who has lived experience as well. And reflecting the fact that at least a third of those on the street uh, have some kind of indigenous ancestry, we want to make sure that we represent that, uh, reflect that uh, in the, the, uh, the, the number of people that we, we can serve when we set up. As I mentioned earlier, we have working groups and we have committees. So this was um, a plan that we had, uh, we were hoping for a rollout at the end of last year before the winter got really bad. But as you can see, it's very meticulously done. We have someone on our team who used to uh, manage programs uh, in corporate life. So he's lending his skills and uh, we've got the deliverables backwards, if you like, you know, what's the date? How long does it take to set some particular aspect of the project up? And then we set a date um, and this will happen once we, once we get started. In terms of funding, our costs are approximately a million dollars over three years. And people say, well, that's a lot of money. Except when you start to think how much homelessness is costing us now. If you keep someone in prison, uh, you know, for a day, how much does that cost? If you uh, constantly have people coming through the doors at an emergency department, which happens, how, how much is that costing our staff, our uh, system? Uh, and how good is that for the person? So we have raised over a quarter of a million dollars in just a few months because we realized, we were surprised, but we realized this is a topic that people actually care about. It's one of the major topics um, at the election, recently our municipal election. We are working with the city and our request to them, apart from helping us find a site, is $100,000 a year. Now back to the site. This is what we're really, really needing. We've worked with the city to find, and there's a lot of city land, um, and some of it light industrial, um, some of it um, parking lots. It's very specific about the kind of place we need because we were offered a piece of land. It was a parking lot on Barton Street. Unfortunately, first of all, it was small, but it was also right up against a residential neighborhood. And um, fortunately, there is a stigma. People are not too happy about having programs like this near their homes. So what we are looking for is somewhere a little bit out of the way outside of the city core, which is what the people we interviewed had asked for, um, but still somewhere where it could accommodate up to 25 homes. And we have a website. I uh, we encourage you to go and have a look and see what we've been up to. We are also on Facebook and Instagram. And um, I think one of the things, it's a, it, this is one of the toughest projects ever I think I've been involved in. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now, but um, it's one of those 
issues that I don't think we can turn our back on. We can't just pretend it's not happening. It's, uh, it's, going to, it's only going to get worse, in my view. And so the urgency is really uh, quite strong. I'm going to stop there. I'm sure um, there's lots to think about. And um, I'm happy to, if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Julia, I'm not sure I'm correct in my thinking, but I thought that the latest proposal for a site was opposite Battlefield Park in Stony Creek. Um, no, I hadn't heard about that. I wonder where you read that. That was interesting. Definitely somewhere, but I can't at the moment put my finger on where I actually read it or heard it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've um, we've we've actually uh, we've explored up to date. We've explored nineteen sites, um, and that involves actually going to each site, taking photographs, um, finding out uh, where the. I have a friend who used to work for Hydro One, so I take her along, and she looks to see where the hydro lines are and how we could hook up to electricity. We also look at if it's you know have to check whether it's contaminated and to what level, because there's different levels of soil contamination. And we live in an industrial city. So, um, you know, that is definitely uh, an issue to consider. But there's ways around if there's a concrete pad that's really helpful in terms of making sure you're not disturbing any contamination. But at the same time, a level, level ground is really much better for placing homes. So there's a few considerations to, to think about. And we have been to we have reported back to various committees. You might have read about us in the paper. And it's a very, unfortunately, a political football, which uh, I hadn't anticipated. You know, one goes into these projects thinking, oh, it's so simple. We just need this and just need that. And there we go. Um, but obviously, things get much more complicated once you get into them. Julie, I hear many people talk about that, the abandoned school or the school that's closed down in downtown Victoria um, and just people saying like, why isn't that available to the homeless? Why can't we use that space? Yeah, that's, that's um, a, it was a, a, one of our first um, places that we looked, the uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, which is York Boulevard. Um, so several, several things with that, the school board uh, put some conditions on. They're, they're great to work with. They're, they were very open. They said, well, um, one of the conditions is that you have a next place to go to when this school gets demolished, which they haven't got an exact date yet, but it is anticipated that the building will be demolished. And if you don't have the next step, then you can't move in. And then when it came to the building itself, there was a there were floods within the building uh, at one point, and uh, it's also deemed unsafe now. So we can't go in the building even to use the showers, which is unfortunate because at the back of the building, that's where the gym is, and that's where the washrooms and the showers are. So we've had to take that off the table. And um, yeah, so that one, you're right, that one um, is not available. I have a question. I read in yesterday's Hamilton Spectator that in downtown Hamilton, many office buildings and there is not, it's not being leased. Is there any way they can maybe make a temporary solution to put some of the homeless in some of these vacant office on leased buildings? That's a really good question. And I read that too. Um, my, my sense, here's what I've learned. And this is from our partners at Inwell. When they open up a, a facility, and they've done terrific work, as you probably know. So what they do is they, they build places. Um, everybody has an apartment, and it's supported. So there's always someone, a, a wraparound service. There's people um, who are there for the residents to make sure that they stay healthy, that everything is OK. What happens though, when they take someone straight from the street and place them in an apartment, it's too big a cultural transition. Street life is completely different to, we have to take off our middle-class lens. 
it, it's it's just a completely different way of life. It's survival. Um, one story I heard, for example, was a gentleman who was placed in uh, one of these units, one of the uh, apartments, and they found out that he was sleeping standing up in the closet. And when they, they said, well, you've got a bed here. Why aren't you sleeping in the bed? And he said, I was abused as a child and I'm too afraid. So, so a lot of the issues, there's a lot of mental health issues. There's a lot of coaching and um, individual work. Everybody is different. And um, you know, that's something you have to bear in mind. So if we opened up, I love your idea. Yes, there's all this empty space and it would seem so reasonable. It may not turn out the way we would hope. Um, the other thing we learned is something called street deck. So if you can imagine you're sleeping on the street and then you need something and someone else who's sleeping on the street helps you, they really it's like a community within the encampment. If you suddenly get somewhere to live, that person is going to say, well, I helped you and I'm still out here. I need to use your washroom. I, I'm, I use substance. I, I, I use drugs, so I need to come in. And then suddenly things get out of hand. And some people find that, understandably, really hard to navigate. Um, mm. it's, it's a very complex world. And I have a feeling that the organizations, including Epic Trust, I believe they own some of the office buildings downtown, they may not be so open to opening the doors for that kind of program. And that's why our program is more of a transitional. It's getting people used to getting back their life skills, living in a community, learning how to live with each other, and having a space of their own, their own where they can put their belongings, their own responsibility, before they do that move into the next place where they're going to live. So, Sandra, I hope that helps answer. Yes, it does. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's such a lost opportunity. I'm not sure how it would work. Maybe it's worth exploring. I don't know. Hi, it's Hinda here. Um, uh, I want to thank you actually for, for, for the work that you're doing. I think it's, uh, it's incredible. Um, it, I'm, I'm sure. I feel frustrated when I read about the roadblocks that you're experiencing. I'm sure you must feel it, you know, a hundred times more. And I guess I'm not understanding why there's so many roadblocks and why there isn't more support from um, from the city. In, yeah. in is it you know? Do, can you um, help me understand? <laughs> Oh gosh, um, thanks Hinda, nice to see you. Uh, yes, it has been beyond frustrating. We've made nine presentations and at the request of staff have written 27 reports, including a 160 page report on um, best practices and what's happening across the country. I think we have, I know Ted McMeekin who helped us initially before he became a counselor is very supportive. Um, and then there's a trickle of maybe one or two councils who say they're supportive and then they're not sure. And then the rest of them, I just don't understand, to be honest. And I, I don't have an answer for you. I think um, it's helpful if each of us write to our counselor and say, we've got to do something. Okay. Um, and find us a piece of land because there's lots of opportunity. Yeah. What, one of the, um, the, the, the areas that seem to be pushing back are the residents of Ward 3. And, um, and I guess what I find hard to understand is if many of the homeless are living on the streets within Ward 3, why do they find that preferable to having the same residents live in tiny houses? Yes, that, that, that was a mystery to us. Um, so let's go back to what Ward 3 looks like, which is, uh, I can't remember the exact boundaries, but 
it, 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 it does have, first of all, it's one of the areas of the city where the land is cheapest. And so when the residents say, oh, we're so surprised all the support services are coming here. Well, that's because the rents are lower there for organizations and nonprofits. Um, the people we spoke to, we had two open, uh, two community meetings. They said exactly what you said, you know, we, we're finding needles, there's sex workers, our children can't play in the parks. And we tried that argument. Well, wouldn't it be better if, you know, people were in proper living conditions and they were just completely resistant. And I think they were thinking that it would attract more people to, to where they live. Um, so it, it was actually, there were a lot of uh, loudly spoken people who were against it. But after the meeting, a couple of businesses came in to us and said, we think it's a great idea. The problem was they were, and we had emails from people saying, yeah, I know you've been hearing negative things, but I just want you to know we support you. And we've had people say, I'll, I'll become a volunteer. What happened though in the end was uh, we, we just felt it really wasn't a safe place for our residents to place, even though it was so tempting to just set up. And um, especially rolling out a new program, you want it to be a success for everybody. And we were more worried about the people living outside our, our small community than the people living within it, to be honest with you. you it really, it comes down to finding a, a site that is a little away from neighborhoods. Julia, um, very interesting. The Kitchener story, the video you showed us, it sounds like the gentleman uh, who helped at the beginning was a, well, a, a land, uh, let's say an industrial, a, a wealthy man who had power. Had, I mean, to me that, seems to, unfortunately that seems to speak at city hall and have you enlist been able to enlist um you know some some people or someone in the group who who actually is um, you know big business or whatnot can use that lobby or who could provide land come hell or high water i mean to me that seems the way to to go forward um I'm sure that's crossed your mind, but um, nonetheless, I, I, I think that would be the way to, you're obviously very well organized, your, 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 your organization, but it does seem to me that it's the politics that are the overwhelming issue here, and you need some powerful people um, to, to uh, blow it up, you know, and break the logjam. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Ron Doyle was, uh, he sadly passed away. Uh, he, he, um, he was quite a character, uh, no question. And he, as, as the movie said, you know, he walked to his own feet. Um, so that program really benefited from the fact he had an industrial piece of land um, and he just let, let, the, let the program set up. After he passed though, the family needed to sell that land and they, the, the program has moved two or three times in the meantime. You're right. Um, we have approached some movers and shakers, and we're still working on it. Um, yeah, that's uh, um, that's really I, the route to go. I, yes. have, I have a suggestion. Yeah. I um, I swim at the Y early morning uh, every uh, uh, every day downtown. I walk by the homeless. I walk by the injection people. I mean, clearly, two things have to happen. One or one of the key issues here is safe injection sites. Um, and, and it turns out, yeah, it was in the church across the street from the Y, but they're moving it. If you know, if you notice, there's a huge uh, development by Leuna going up beside um, the Y. Joe Mancinelli is a, is a generous, an incredibly generous man. He's not gonna want all these street people uh, around his new thing. It strikes me if, somehow you could enlist the help of him. He has land. He is very community. In fact, he supports, believe it or not, a big charity in Israel. There's a story behind that. Um, but I, even though, I he's not Jewish. even though he's not Jewish, Italian, I would suggest he, he, he he's, uh, could be a very helpful in this one. If oh. you haven't approached him already. No, we haven't. Um, 
I just want to make sure I've got his last. Is it Manson? Ali, I'll get your email from Paula. I'll, I'll send the, uh, you the information. Because yeah. I'm sure he's thought about it. And there's another developer that um, in, who's putting up all sorts of business uh, in that area, a much younger man. Uh, but I'll, um, I'll send you his name too. I mean, he, he, the, it seems they're not, obviously, if they can't sell their condos or rent their condos because what's going on the street, it doesn't make sense. And these are developers. They're powerful. They have space and money it seems to me that that that's the way to to go uh, i'll send you some names and we can maybe talk talk offline about it yeah i got some, i got some, i got some ideas i i love that idea mark thank you and that's something I, that's crossed my mind too it, it, and actually in that article that sandra um mentioned they talked about how um, office workers didn't feel safe coming yeah. down and I think um, I, I know from people who grew up here, going downtown in the past used to be this really, you know, you dress up and it would be like a special outing. And now, uh, you know, you're you sort of don't want to go. You 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 just you wouldn't want to be downtown at night, for example. And and it's definitely it's bad optics. It would make total sense to fix the problem. I mean, yeah. And, and you wonder also. I'm sorry to manipulate to control things here, but. I mean, you did in the article in the spec. Um, someone, some leader from Effort Trust was commenting, and you know they've been so generous to our community, the Jewish community. It's unbelievable. Uh, I'm sure you've thought about chatting with Effort Trust about getting some help. And it, yeah, it's it's interesting, Mark, um, because I, you know, obviously, like most of us, you know, we we know the family. I, I just felt I felt uncomfortable, to be honest with yeah. you, going to talk to them. Um, maybe I mean, it, they may it not, takes someone may... like you to do that rather than yeah. It's, it sounds like I'm getting roped in, but I got <laughs> I got lots of ideas for you. You know, it, it struck me. Oh, I'm just talking so much. I guess you've you've struck a chord here. Uh, I I remember uh, actually when I was at Rideau Hall getting the Order of Canada. Hind and I sat with another couple that were getting it. They're from Kitchener Waterloo, and they they haven't done the homeless thing. Yes, they have. They were a generation ahead. They've built um, all sorts of um, housing and skills training places for these types of people. You must, I guess, I forget their name. It was Joe Mancini. It, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And they, they, that's right. Um, and uh, they they were obviously had done it all their lives and were aw awarded for it, but. Um, Yes, it, 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 and it was in Kitchener Waterloo, and apparently it was very avant garde. This goes back, I guess, a number of years. But yeah, I, I guess I mean it strikes me and Hinda that this is the uh, probably this and climate change are the two most uh, um, you know uh, biggest challenges we have, and and we've got to do something in our community and our as you know our city hall. Oh God, they've got their head up, their bums. And they've done it for years. You you know, it's not only the housing; it's everything. We live. We have a very unusual city government here, and it's been a problem for years. Thanks, um, Mark. Yeah, I'd I'd love to uh, chat with you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Take this further because you you really resonated here with some great ideas. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um. Thank you. I want to comment about um office towers um, as a corporate interior designer for over 44 years and having designed more than a million square feet in office towers I can tell you that they're mostly not um, they're not set up for um, okay. community living I don't know if zoning would be an issue but they only have um, microwave kitchens uh, if they have a kitchen at all. And to put in uh, cooking facilities, you'd have to do construction to uh, create uh, a fire enclosed room. It has to be um, fire rated. So it would take a lot of work to do this if they were going to be designated for that purpose. Plus they have a limited number of washroom stalls. So it's only the washrooms. There are no shower facilities. So again, there would be more construction required to use an existing office space for that. 
the other issue is um, liability to adjacent tenants that are in the building and also um, access. Most office towers to get to and from the elevators um, operate between maybe 6 and 6, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So you wouldn't be able to get into the building to access the space. So there's lots of, of um, roadblocks that would have to be um, torn down before you could consider using an office tower for homes. Um, a lot of the spaces, the office, if, they, if it is divided into offices, those offices don't typically have locks on them. So you would have to put locks on them. The windows are typically, if there's a window into an office, you would have to come up with something to cover those because they don't have privacy blinds. Often there's just a band of, of some kind of um, decal that um, blocks a portion of the window. So, I mean, that's great ideas and there are I mean, there is 13% of the buildings downtown are unoccupied, but there would be challenges just like with anything else to use those for someone to live in. Well, wow, that's so fascinating. Thanks, Michelle, because I, I was looking at it from the, the, the resident's point of view, but the structural point of view is, is key, right? So yeah. that's so fascinating. Well. It means also that there could be challenges. I think it was mentioned in the article. They touched on it, just converting them to condos, right? As you mentioned, you'd need an awful lot of money, really, to transform them by the sound of it, correct? Yes, yes. Mm. But again, um, yeah, you'd have to do a lot of interior. And you'd have to wipe out what was there because most of it is temporary walls. They're... Um, mm temporary partitions that are not built of um, drywall and, uh, you know, studs and drywall. There are a lot of them are movable walls. So you just, you know, you pick up the wall and you move it to reconfigure spaces quite easily. So those would not be considered um, permanent walls, uh, nor would they be um, fire you know, they, they'd be an issue in terms of codes between spaces. So um, if you were going to convert spaces to that type of facility, um, it could be done easily. Um, but then again, by code, there's a certain number of people that are allowed on each floor because of weight and and that kind of stuff, just to hold, keep, keep the structure intact so wow. it's um it's interesting it would be a fabulous project to work on um but you would have to incorporate um venting for each unit would have uh condominiums each unit would have their own kitchens probably which again um are not accommodated for in the infrastructure of office towers so that kind of venting and and those kinds of things so yeah would be really exciting to to try that um, with a, get a group of architects working on it and just take one building and see what happens wouldn't it well i would suggest you could go to an interior designer but <laughs> oh okay sure <laughs> there you go and we've got one right here i think that's amazing expertise and and yes. be here and share it with this project um, Mark's advice as well. Um, I just wanted to point out in the chat, uh, Elizabeth, who's not able to speak because she's uh, she's uh, got a, a cold. Um, she's going back, circling back to city council and how city uh, government works, um, asking about the new mayor. Would she be an advocate of a program like this? <laughs> I heard that, Ivan. <laughs> Um, we we've had two meetings with uh, with Mayor Horvath. Um, it's a little hard to tell where she stands on this, um, and I, I I think she's just easing into her new job. Right. 
So mm -hmm. it's 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 maybe too early, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Enid also commented in the chat that just and I am very curious to sit down with Mark and learn more about um, what is dysfunctional about our city uh, leadership. Huh. Uh, <laughs> a long topic, perhaps. Um, it's Enid says it's interesting that our city leaders continue to struggle with the LRT, another project that's been instituted in Kitchener. Maybe we need to take uh, some advice and modeling in governance from Kitchener. They seem to be doing a, a better job than our city. Yeah, it is. It is curious, and as as Mark said, it's uh, we do scratch our heads sometimes about uh, how things. I've got one more question to ask you. I travel along Barton Street, just east of uh, Hamilton General. There's a lot of empty commercial places there. You think that they could do something and make if you want needed room for housing somewhere this, this would be you know an, an area my goodness there's probably lots of other land in the city like that that's you know that that could be used have you looked into that the other thing is we talk about the city did we look at the province what, what kind of aid can we get from the province for something like this hmm. um okay go just let's do the barton street first i think um michelle's point um converting a store is you know that's a whole other thing too you might have to pull it down and, and put up something mm -hmm. in place or something like that yeah yeah, yeah. it that that that's um I, I agree with you there's a lot of um boarded yeah. up stores i think there's a lot of um, uh also absentee landlords involved oh yes oh yes yeah um, yeah so what about the province would they be of any help with this issue the current government might not be so uh, friendly towards it, but uh, no. I don't know. Um, we talk about the Ford uh, government, really, and then there's no interest. No, no way. Oh, okay. No, we have met. We have met with MPPs, and um, some of them are very supportive. It's just finding a pot of money that fits. And right now their focus is on long-term housing, which is fine, affordable housing, or expanding the green belt. And, um, yeah. and so we don't fit necessarily in, in that kind of. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> Thanks though. Oh, I want to, oh, sorry. I just want to take this opportunity to give uh, some final words of, of thanks so much to Julia. You know, this, this work is so vital in tikkun olam. Our Jewish values call us to, to care about others in need. And this is a big issue in our community that needs our attention. I think we heard we can all be writing letters. And um, I think that's important to, uh, to do our part in, in urging our city government on to making a solution that allows these tiny shelters to be erected and to start start helping our community in a really powerful and important way. So Julia, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm being a little speedy here because uh, there's another temple meeting that's gonna happen at noon oh. and I need to segue over there. So I apologize for my brevity at uh, ending this meeting, but it really is so good to see you all. A reminder that Purim is, uh, is tomorrow night uh, here at, uh, we're starting at 6.30 p.m. Bring a mac and cheese in a box. That's your shaker, your Gregor, and uh, we're donating them after. We have a big barrel in our uh, in our lobby to collect those uh, from you. Enid, I know you're coming for a preview uh, today with Doreen because you can't make it tomorrow night. So uh, we're excited about our dress rehearsal this afternoon. Too. I am Great. too. Looking forward Great. to it. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, happy Purim. It is a dar. Let's be happy and, and share our positivity, especially with this project. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Julia. Thanks.